Although nominally the follow-up to the Panzer III, the Panzer IV was actually developed almost simultaneously. The doctrine of the time, formulated by Heinz Guderian, dictated that there be two vehicle types for mechanized warfare, a speedy and hard-hitting AFV for tank-to-tank -tank combat, and a slower, more lightly armed vehicle for supporting the mechanized infantry. The Panzer III, being the lighter and faster of the two, was the designated tank fighter while the slower and heavier Panzer IV was the one that was sticking with the infantry. It wasn't until the two actually engaged Soviet and English tanks that they realized just how underpowered their two tanks were. The Panzer III's high-velocity 50mm gun and the Panzer IV's low-velocity 75mm gun were just not good at taking out enemy tanks. By 1943, the roles were almost reversed. The III was now a lighter tank sticking with the infantry, and the IV had been upgraded to accept the longer KWK-40, L-43, and L-48, a much higher velocity gun that proved to be much more capable at engaging armored targets. It was in this form that the Panzer IV would come to be known as Germany's workhorse throughout World War II, having about 8,500 units produced, a number that includes all variants including tank destroyers, self-propelled guns, and anti-aircraft guns built on the chassis. The model on the table today is the Girls in Panzer licensed Panzer IV Ausführung D by Dragon. Dragon Models Limited is mostly known for their meticulous attention to detail and lengthy build times. In 2006, this model was originally released with over a thousand parts. The Platz line is an attempt to slim that down by a lot. In fact, this kit has about 200 parts, a fifth of the original part count. I've been writing this script forever, and I'm super excited to start, so let's get to it. The hull is cast bathtub style, as we're all used to, with only the rear plate needing to be installed. The final drives on the front of the tank are expertly detailed inside and out, but this semicircular ring doesn't have any locating features to keep it in the correct position. And if you go to the manual, HANA isn't exactly helpful either. The front glacis has the zigzag layout characteristic of A and D variants. The driver's vision slit is the letterbox style, which was seen on all variants until the E. The hatches all across the tank are incredibly well done, and they've got detail on both sides, something that most manufacturers won't do. While it is an excellent addition and I love to see it for manufacturers, there's no interior on this tank, so we better keep these hatches closed. It's weird to say this, but the fenders really show how much attention was paid by Dragon to getting all the details right. The non-skid texture is stamped into both sides of the plate, and they've added these tiny little return springs on the back. While I'm here, I should point out that the manual calls for both reflectors to be cut off, when only the starboard side should be. You can see this in the show, as well as in the illustrations that the manual provides. The engine compartment has a number of plain hatches on top and air louvers on the side. I found it a little unusual that the left side is intake and the right side is exhaust, instead of both sides being intake and exhausting out the back. The instructions say to assemble the louvers before attaching them, but I honestly found it much easier to put the back plate on, and then the louvers. All of these features cover the Maybach HL120 TRM, a 300 horsepower V12 petrol engine which propelled the tank along at about 30 miles an hour. It exhausts through this big beefy muffler which got seam lines all around, and those need to be taken care of. Round shapes are difficult to sand with files or scrape away with an X-Acto blade, so I bought these sanding sponges. If you don't have any sanding sponges yet, go buy them right now. These are awesome, and I will be sure to keep them in my toolbox into perpetuity. The instructions call for this pair of holes to be filled, which honestly would have been much easier to do before attaching the upper and lower hole. They're filled with Tamiya putty and sanded back with the otaku sponges. Additionally, the leftmost bracket for the tow cable is in a different spot from the tank in the show, so I carefully remove it and add a new flange made out of quarter millimeter sheet styrene. It's sanded back to the appropriate thickness before drilling the mounting hole and attaching a piece of bent wire because the original hook decided to fly away. Turrets of both the Panzer III and Panzer IV are kind of a wonky octagon shape. Early variants had this cupola bulge in the back. On either side are the hatches and bump stops for the gunner and loader with their respective vision slits directly adjacent. Behind each hatch on the rear of the turret are a pistol port for each crewman. Up on top is the commander's cupola flanked by two round hatches that I think are signal ports just in case your radio gets disabled and you need to signal the platoon with flags. The cupola itself is equipped with five direct vision blocks all around, but they appear to have been molded shut. There's also a pair of bolt heads at the 12 o'clock position that need to be removed so we can attach the vein sight. Directly ahead of this is a rectangular hatch that for the life of me I cannot figure out what it's for. On the outside edges are the grab handles, and while they look okay as is, it'd be very easy to remove these and replace them with a length of bent wire. 
Moving forward to the mantlet, we can see the direct vision doors on the extreme edges. These doors would swing up and out, which you can see in the show, to reveal a bulletproof plexiglass block. Just inboard of those are two holes. One is for the coaxially mounted Maschinengewehr Vieren Dreizig, and the other is for the gunner's telescopic sight. Between the two is, of course, the short barreled 75mm Kampfwagen Konona Sieben Dreizig. Dragon have molded the muzzle in one piece using their famous slide molding technology to completely avoid seam lines, and good lord, they've even added rifling. This bracket underneath the gun is the aerial deflector whose purpose is to make sure the rigid antenna doesn't get shot off by the machine gun. Tanks have tracks, so let's talk tracks. Track on the Panzer IV worked its way around the drive sprocket in the front, below the eight road wheels, around the idler, and across the four return rollers before returning to the sprocket. The suspension consists of eight rubber-tired road wheels per side, with each pair of wheels being mounted on bogies. Each bogey is given its bounce by this hefty set of leaf springs and are limited in their travel by these bump stops. This hole in the extreme rear is where another bump stop would be mounted, a feature I think mostly seen on later vehicles. The bogey suspension itself was an interesting deviation from typical German torsion bar suspension systems, with the Panzer IV being the only vehicle newer than the Panzer II to not have torsion bars. The switch came with certain trade-offs of course, mainly exchanging wheel travel for ease of maintenance. Torsion bars require essentially the entire bottom fifth of the hull, and not having to allocate all that space means you can have more room in the fighting compartment and at a bottom escape hatch. Once it's all assembled, the model sits dead rock solid flat on its road wheels. This is the first kit I've built that does this straight out of the box, and it's oddly satisfying. The idlers generally came in either 7 or 8 spoked variants as modeled here. The track continues to the front of the vehicle across the four return rollers. These are also very simple, essentially just two large rubber tires with a gap between them to serve as a track guide. The tracks look good, or at least they did before my cat decided they looked tasty. Does anybody want a cat? I had a whole paragraph written about the details that Dragon had included, but obviously that's all for naught now. Suffice it to say, they were quite good. I ordered a new pair of tracks from eBay, and really the only difference I can see is the guide horns here are molded solid. Everything except the tracks is primed using Rust-Oleum Painter's Touch Gray, keeping the model in a few key sub-assemblies to make painting easier further down the line. Using Tamiya XF1 Black and XF2 White, I apply shadows and highlights across the model. I shoot almost pure black into the areas most in shadow and use the white to emulate the illumination of the sun as well as highlight some key focal points like the crew hatches and commander's cupola. I really like the way Dana Howell does zenithal highlighting and I try to work it into everything I paint now. For the base coat, I mix up Tamiya XF1, 2, and 18 medium blue to get a pleasant blue-gray. Panzer Gray in reality was almost black, but the color in the show is decidedly much brighter. I must admit here, while I love pre-shading, doing it for dark colors generally ends pretty poorly for me. Essentially all of the pre-shading I did has been erased by the subsequent color coats. Realizing this, I lighten the color further and try to salvage my highlights with some post-shading. In the end, I think I did okay. For the rubber tires, I add a few drops of track primer to black, both from Vallejo, and carefully brush paint around the hubs. I paint the area between the wheels with the same color, but this is just to darken the area. The rubber tires did not extend this far. With a sponge, I apply the same color with a little more track primer in the mix, just to break up the monotony and make the rubber look a little more worn. The tracks are sprayed straight XF2 without a primer beforehand. Honestly, I should have primed these the same as the rest of the tank because the paint just didn't stick super well. A fair amount of people praise DS tracks for their ability to take paint and glue, but in this experience, I found them less cooperative than Tamiya tracks. To try and cover the areas of paint that didn't stick, I randomly brushed track primer and neutral gray along and across the tracks. The muffler is painted with a technique I learned from watching Night Shift with a few tweaks to fit my chosen media. Night Shift is fantastic, and he's much better at this than I am, so go watch his video when you get a chance. He uses enamels instead of oils, and can therefore go without any protective layers of clear coat. However, since I use mineral spirits to thin my oils, I apply a matte clear coat before my brown wash. Now that we have the whole thing together, I guess we should probably talk about the bits and bobs floating around the vehicle. Just behind the port side headlight are the siren, fire extinguisher, and a pair of massive S-hooks. This pair of wrenches is used in conjunction with this much longer wrench to adjust the track tension at the rear of the tank. Adjacent to these is a set of long handle wire cutters. This small bracket above the ladder holds a triangular hook used for connecting tracks. There are two tanker bars on either side of the louvers. Mounted on the port side louvers is the cleaning rod for the 75mm. 
A little further back is the blackout tail light. The blackout light uses a very novel idea that I won't go into here, but you can go to this website to read about it. There isn't much to talk about on the rear, but I will mention what I can. The tail lights were underpainted with Vallejo metal colors aluminum before two coats of color and cleaned up with Panzer Gray. The colors of the lenses were different ratios of Vallejo red and MSP marigold yellow. Just above the muffler is another smaller muffler for the tank's auxiliary generator, which provides electricity for the tank's lights as well as the turret traverse mechanism. This small door to the right is a switch for the inertial starter, which can be primed through this port with the jack handle at the front of the tank. Sitting nicely on top of the muffler is the tank's smoke discharger, the navel cuts and abwerfwerf. The navel cuts and abwerfwerf. How many fucking syllables are in this word? The navel cuts and abwerfwerfton. It was essentially just a rack of smoke grenades that would fall from the tank one at a time whenever the commander pulled a cable. On the starboard side is the other tail light, that other tanker bar, the aerial antenna, a shovel, a 15 ton panzer jack, the jack handle for the inertial starter, and an axe. Once I finish all the detail painting, I spray a layer of clear coat. If you watch the show, you'll notice a lot of these tools bopping around the Panzer IV. Only, there's a few issues between what's on screen and what's in the box. This kit is a rebranded tank that was originally modeled to be as historically accurate as possible. That is to say, it is not modeled on what appears in the show, and what is shown on screen is not necessarily correct. The ladder on the port side appears in the show, but is very difficult to find in period photos. The Panzer Jack in the show appears to be the 10-ton jack when all period photos I've seen have the 15-ton jack instead. The lenses in the tail lights are the wrong color, there's no cable stored on the back, the Nebelkurz and Abwehrverrichtung doesn't have any chains, and most egregiously of all, there's no bucket. Before moving on to the decals, I decided to work backwards and lightly weather the top coat. I emulated scratch paint with a lightened version of the base color, sponged and dry brushed on areas of the tank that would see the most wear. For even more wear, I painted a layer of exposed metal by very carefully dotting on pure German grey from Vallejo and some color in the form of rusted metal by mixing it one to one with track primer. In this shot, you can pretty easily see the three different colors. Decals are best applied over a glossy surface, so I spray a pretty heavy layer of Tamiya Gloss Clear on the areas they'll be applied. The decals are very nicely done with pretty thin carrier film and vibrant colors. I've chosen to use the number two scheme as it's my favorite from the show. The other schemes included are the post cleanup and the practice for Anzio. They're soaked in warm water and carefully slid into position before an application of decal solution. Once dry, we can spray a matte clear coat over the whole model to seal everything in. Because I can't run out and get more Tamiya matte clear from the usual get the spot in the middle of a pandemic, I had to settle for Tester's Dole Coat. This is my first time using it and, to be completely honest, I'm not super thrilled with the result. I think once I run this can dry, I'll return to Tamiya clear coats. I start weathering below the fenders with oil dots and washes. I've decided to go much lighter on this than I have in the past since I'm trying to replicate a vehicle that's been used but not abused. The wash I apply to the bogies isn't quite as opaque as I usually mix it and I stray away from rust tones as much as I can. These two doors here are filler caps for the gasoline engine, so I slop a little bit of ochre on them to replicate spilled fuel. All of the dots are quickly pulled down and softened with a dry brush. The top deck is given a pin wash which is quickly wiped away since I'm applying this over a matte coat and not a gloss coat so there's a heightened risk of the clear coat absorbing the tint and staining the surface. I grate chalk pastels over the surface to add dust and some tone, then I attack it with a series of brushes. First I use a short, somewhat stiff brush to compact it all down, then a wide brush to sweep away the excess, and then I use the air brush to blow away the rest. I honestly discovered this by accident and I think I'm in love. For the mud on the tracks, I mix up these Vallejo products until I get a consistency kinda like a fast food chocolate shake. They are then sloppily applied to the tracks, and I'm not super careful about getting them on the running gear or other parts of the tank. I then water it down to a milky consistency and splatter it across the running gear. I made some grass by trimming the ends off some old paint brushes, and I mixed it into the mud to apply to the tracks. Some of the bristles came out very long, so I very carefully removed them to make sure they didn't stick out. Once this is all dry, I return to the chalk pastels and apply different dust tones. Finally, I mix track primer and gloss varnish in a 10 to 1 ratio and apply this on select parts of the track. The last thing to do is to cement the track to the running gear and give it a little bit of sag. And that's our build! Dragon has a reputation for incredible attention to detail, and even in this pared down kit, that is clearly evident. 
There were certain aspects I wanted to talk about but didn't have the time, like how the final drives have the correct details on the inside, a piece that almost nobody is going to see. There are a few areas that I'll chalk up to accidents on my part. I feel like the chalk pastels on the bottom were a little heavy handed and I probably should have walked those back. But overall, I'm incredibly pleased with this and I think it might be my best model thus far. If you're a fan of Girls in Panzer, I highly recommend purchasing this because it was a blast to build. Okay. So that was the video on the Platz by Dragon Girls in Panzer Panzer 4D. If you stuck around to the end, if you stuck around to the end, thank you very much for sticking around this long. I really appreciate it. I had a lot of fun building this one. Um, you know, Dragon is known for their quality, and this was exemplar, exemplary. Dragon is known for their quality, and this was absolutely incredible in every regard. I had one piece. That needed a little bit of work. Uh, the top deck was warped towards here in the back. And, you know, it, it still fit together just fine. Honestly, I'm really pleased with this one. And I don't want to toot my own horn, but I think it's really good. Uh, I'm very pleased with it. I think it's probably the best model that I've done definitely for this channel, maybe in my life. Yeah, I'm very pleased with it. I'd like to thank my dear friend Catherine for loaning me her sewing machine for as long as she did so that I could make this stupid outfit. I'd like to thank Potential History and the Chieftain for turning me into the disgraceful weeaboo you see before you. And I guess on a more personal note, I should say that uh, the flow of videos is going to be more erratic in the future. Uh, I've been trying to keep it to a month or a month and a half per video, and just the way my life has gone the past six months, I don't know if I can keep that up and still, like, be happy. Obviously, coronavirus is still a thing, so guys, please be safe. Uh, there's a lot of protests going around, uh, going on around the country. Please be safe. I guess while I'm on that subject, I should say all cops are bastards. Uh, abolish ICE. Justice for George Floyd. You know, if, if that offends you, then I don't care. I think that's about it. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I, I really appreciate... Uh, the people who, who, not only the people who watch these, but the people who engage with me and, uh, you know, show th that they're getting something from this. It, it really makes me feel good, you know, like, like I've got a purpose or a meaning or something. I wonder if my neighbors can see me. I hope not. Anyway, like, comment, subscribe, all that. Please be safe. Be excellent to each other. Have a good night.